everybody. I'm Tom Vassell. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast. This is a show all about board games and the people who play them. This show is sponsored by Panasaurus Games, who has great stuff like Control and Sonara. And they just announced uh, Dinosaur World. They've made the fantastic Dinosaur Island game. Really like that one. This new one here looks like the dinosaurs might be getting more out of control. We'll find out more as time goes by what the game's about. It's going to be coming to Kickstarter, so keep an eye out for that. Well, if you see me start breaking down into tears throughout this episode, it's because this week I'm taking daughter number two, my daughter Amy, to college. She just turned 18, and that is two of my seven children out of the house at this point in time. Uh, well, I remember when she came on here as a very little girl at the beginning of the Dice Tower, but times move on. Well, that being said, let's get started with this show. We got lots of great contributors, lots of things to check out. Here we go. As we continue to go back 30 years ago and look at the different games that were popular, one here is Gang of Four. Now, Gang of Four actually, it was designed 30 years ago, didn't become popular until Days of Wonder made it. In fact, this is the game that kind of put Days of Wonder on the map. One of their first games, a card game here. This is what we call, some people call it ladder climbing, other people call it a card shedding game. Essentially, you're getting rid of all the cards in your game. In, in your hand. And you do so by playing cards. If I play a five, you have to play a card that's higher than that or pass. But you can also play uh, maybe a pair of cards or things like that. And in this one, it's called Gang of Four, based on a political party, Gang of Four. Uh, the, playing a Gang of Four, four of the same kind, is the strongest thing you can play in this. And there's also Dragon and a couple other cards in this. There are many of these card shedding games out there. Tichu is probably the most popular. I like Gang of Four better. It's very simple, but sometimes simplicity is not a bad thing. In fact, when I initially played Gang of Four, I thought, nah, you know, eh, because I like trick-taking games usually better than ladder climbing games. But as time has gone by and I played more and more of these style games, I find myself keep going back to Gang of Four and saying, wow. And the Days of Wonder production was a beautiful, gorgeous production. So certainly one to check out. So that's a game to think about from 30 years ago, Gang of Four. Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Yvonne University. Today we are talking about Pan Am, the board game, not the company that went under. Or at least it is based on that company. It's an air travel True. game. And it's, it's interesting, you know, it's a... Uh... It's a root building, stock holding, manipulation. Not as much as manipulation. Not manipulation, but yep. it's, it's one of those games, a bit like Arkwright, obviously a lot lighter than Arkwright, yes. but one where you are trying to, you win by holding stocks, mm -hmm. not by having money. So you've got to invest your money uh, through the game and then watch the stock price grow. So you're always trying to skate through with as little money as you can because you know the stocks are mm -hmm. probably going to go up. And then the other part that's quite interesting about this game is that Pan Am, uh, which was such a big company, serves as kind of an AI in the game. So you're yeah. actually playing as little companies trying to make your own uh, routes around the world. And then Pan Am just comes and buys them up. And when they do, you get a big chunk of money back that you can invest in Pan Am stocks. And so you kind of want to utilize Pan Am's expansion to your to your benefit. I thought it was bad because it started from Miami and then you started building your route around there. And I thought, oh, and then you lose your income when you actually sell your route to Pan Am. But then it's not bad. You get a lump sum of money, it'll fund your next turn and it'll fund you to buy the stock. So, um, hey, it's one of those uh, route building that I like, um, beside Ticket to Ride, Air Lunch Europe, and um, On the Underground. So, uh, yeah, my top route building networking. So we are Meeple University on YouTube and also on the Dice Tower for how to play Pocket Playthrough and Life Playthrough. See you next time. Hi everybody. Hello, we are Ryan and Bethany. From Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. Today we're talking about breakdancing meeples. This is a real-time game where you are rolling these meeples as fast as you possibly can, trying to get them to stand up in certain ways to turn into these tricks, these routines. Uh, you have these four one-minute rounds, um, and at the end of all that, whoever has the most points wins. So one of the things that we do in our family, not related to the game, but it is related to the game, is when our girls get kind of crazy, as all kids do, we have these dance parties. So we'll put on some other 
upbeat song like Shut Up and Dance With Me and we just all four of us as a family dance and go crazy. They get their willies out and then we can focus on the task at hand. So we just have to take like a mini break in our day and then we can move forward. Yeah, so speaking of mini breaks in your day, this is what happens in this game too. It's real time and those one minute rounds are all real time. However, in between each one, you get a chance to kind of take a breather. You do your scoring, you um, draft new cards, and then you gear up to do it again. And so for people who are scared of real time games, this is uh, one that is still accessible for people like that. It is still fun. And I really like the balance between the the three routine cards. routine cards that you have. I feel like it's enough to focus on while you're di and while you're rolling all your meeples, but you're not like overwhelmed by all the options that are there. I felt like it was a really nice balance between those um, that anxiety of trying to get stuff done, but also just like not too much. <laughs> You guys, this game was fun. It was fast. It's a great way to start the night out. You know, it gets everybody's kind of, you know, brings everybody's guards down. It's an icebreaker in a way. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, this is super fun. It's travel friendly as well. We really enjoyed Breakdancing Meeples. If you'd like to hear more from us, you can find us on Facebook or YouTube under Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. Everybody, this is Ryan and Bethany. Hoping you have a happy, healthy breakfast. Bye, Bye guys. Bye, everybody. Okay, so this week we're going to be taking a look at the little paint station that Holly and me have put together for her as she's now painting. We got a bunch of paints here uh, from Army Painter and um, bought a little desk lamp here so that when she, you know, you turn it on and use it here. We have this mat here covering the table protecting it and then a plate. She takes these outside when she spray paints them uh, with the primer. I bought this from Amazon, just a nice little thing that holds all the paint. And we 3D printed this. This is a thing that holds your miniature for you. So when you put the miniature on, you can put the rubber bands on, and then you can just pick it up and move it around before you paint it. And then I bought these from Amazon. These are things to hold the paint. I thought these would be pretty cool because the way these are put in here, they hold the paint in a different direction more than normal. And you can just look at them and instantly see what color they are. Not only can you see what color they are, you can also see how much of the paint is left. So for example, you see a lot of this red has been used here. And so we actually have backup paints in different places. Down here are all washes. These are hard to tell what the colors are because washes all tend to be dark in general. Um, but yeah, that's it. We got some glue laying around here. And um, this is the wet palette here. That she uses it got her wet power you keep the paints in from day to day but this is what her station's like and uh she says she's been enjoying the painting so there you go that's the dice tower painting station hey guys it's deanna i have another educational game to share with you today today i'm going to be talking about the game zingo we have two versions of this game zingo and they have several others as well the two that we have are the word building version as well as the sight word version zingo is a game that is very similar to the game bingo in the game you have six double-sided cards one side of the cards is more of a beginner level and the back side is more of a intermediate level to play zingo you are going to utilize the zinger that is included in your box and it holds 72 tiles for the game you're going to slide it down and slide it back and that's going to reveal two tiles and then if one of the tiles matches something that's on your card then you yell it out and the first person to yell it out gets that tile and adds it to their board once both those tiles have been put on someone's board or if you can't find any matches, the tile is removed, and the first player to complete their card is the winner. I feel like Zingo is a really great game for those early elementary ages, like kindergarten through third grade. I really like that the cards are double-sided so that I can put it on the easier side for my kindergartner, but then do it on the harder side for my fifth grader and my third grader. I also really like that two tiles come out at a time, and that way um, two people that are playing are usually able to get a tile instead of just one person. It makes it just a little bit less competitive um, for all my kids to play and um, I like that it's really fast paced so it's really easy to play this game quickly and then reset and play again. If you're looking for a fun educational kind of fast paced game to play with your kids then I definitely recommend that you check out Zingo. Like I said I think they have four versions of this game. So that's my game for today. I hope you guys are doing well and I hope you enjoy the rest of board game breakfast. I'll see you next time with another educational game. Bye. So what's
coming out from the Dice Tower this week. We will be continuing crowd surfing. Crowd surfing is now a weekly show. Every Wednesday, 2 o'clock, we'll be taking a look at the Kickstarter projects that are live on Kickstarter that are ending in the next week or so and tell you what we think of them. Board Game Breakfast will be going up this week, and Roy, Mike, and Z are going to be doing a top 10 games that I'm wrong about. That's a weird topic. Uh, lots of games to review. Raiders of Scythia. Uh, we're all going to be taking a look at the small world of Warcraft. Um, I'll be taking a look at Chartered, Zoocracy, Aftershock, uh, Roll It. And there's quite a few games. I'm excited to take a look at these throughout the week. Uh, also, we'll, you'll see some app reviews and we'll continue my 10,000 and Below series. So keep an eye out for all of that. And in the course of podcasts, lots of podcasts in the Dice Tower Network. Even though you're not commuting as much these days, take a chance. Listen to some of these podcasts. Really fantastic stuff. You can find all that at DiceTowerNetwork.com. Hey, everyone. Good morning. I'm Anna Maria from Girls Game Shelf. And I've been thinking a lot about how we've been doing a lot of things virtually this summer and spring. We've got a number of virtual conventions that are still coming up. There've been some really great ones this summer and I'm excited about like UKGE and NunPub and Shelf of Palooza, which will all be in the next four weeks. But doing things virtually kind of made me think about vacation plans and holidays and how we've all had to readjust our plans for this summer. So it really got me thinking about how themes and board games translate to allow you ha to have these type of virtual experiences, if you will, something that you're doing that you put on the table for an hour, hour and a half or so, which allows you to live out, you know, a different type of fantasy. So for this segment, I wanted to talk about virtual holidays, the chance to go and travel and see something new, but through the board game on your table. So my first recommendation is Parks. I love this one, particularly for that mid-century modern art that really kind of gives you the feel of doing a road trip. It's kind of a beautiful trek of each individual traveler through various national parks throughout the country. So in particular, it's a really interesting way to for you to visit through your tabletop places that maybe you didn't even really know existed or some of the landmarks that are in those places that you've heard of, but you haven't had an opportunity to visit yet. Next is Zoom in Barcelona, which evokes the feelings of kind of rushing willy-nilly through a European city trying to take in as many sites as you can. You play as people who are traveling throughout the city taking pictures. And it's got a really unique art style that really kind of evokes the feel of being on the back of a motorbike or scooter, zipping through town trying to find landmarks and different sites. And finally, there's Takedo, which for me was one of the earliest games that wasn't kind of either fantasy or fighting themed that really kind of opened my eyes to the idea that board games could take you any place you wanted to go, even if it was just a simple trip with beautiful meals, meeting strangers along the way. I love the simplicity of the box art. The art inside the box is also gorgeous. And even though it's a competitive game, it's hard not to be super happy and and super chill as you're visiting hot springs and buying trinkets. So those are my three favorite ways to travel through my tabletop. What are yours? I genuinely would love to see some suggestions down in the comments below of things that I could try out to have a, another type of holiday this summer. If you like the video, head on over to Girls Game Shelf and give us a like, and we'll see you soon. Have a great week. Bye. Hi everyone, it's Clara and I'm back talking about another board game that I haven't played but I think I'd really enjoy. Uh, before I do that, I just wanted to give a sh huge shout out to you, uh, the community at Board Game Breakfast. Um, you've been really welcoming and it's been really nice to be a part of this community. As a trans person, you never know what to expect and on my YouTube channel, I you know I talk about science and I talk about uh, improving equity in society, so I kind of knew what to expect. I wasn't sure here, so it's been really nice. Thank you. Uh, with that, I think we know that I uh, love fantasy by now. I think that we know that I love um, a, a bit of role playing and the RPG side of things. So, my game today is called Call to Adventure. So, I just saw Tom do a review of the expansion, and if I'm honest, the the original game just passed me by, and so I went back and I watched loads of reviews and stuff, and uh, it's shot to the top of my list of games that I really want to play. 
So you're building a character, I guess in the same way as roleplay, you're building your character before you necessarily play uh, uh, an adventure. Uh, and that's kind of an, a unique thing, but I, it's done in a very different way. You're playing cards, you're dropping runes. You're dropping runes, you're not rolling dice, you're dropping runes. That's really weird and unique, and I like that. And you're, um, yeah, and you're using your cards to try and gain other cards and improve your character. Uh, in his original review, Tom said that he thought it'd be great for developing a character for, say, Dungeons & Dragons. And I completely agree. I'm really uh, thinking the next time I DM a campaign, I might try and get my players to use this game to build their character. Because I think we'll get some really unique suggestions. So the game looks really fun. It's a fairly short game by the looks of it. And uh, yeah, I just think I'd really enjoy it. But I don't know. What do you think from what you know of me already? And uh, once again, thanks so much. Until next time, bye-bye. Howdy, folks. Welcome to By the Numbers. My name is Hunter Thomason from the Family Showdown. This time on By the Numbers, we're looking at my Through the Year series where we look at the best game on Board Game Geek by year, starting with 1970, this time 1999. Take a look at the top five from 1999. We see the number one game is Paths of Glory, coming in at 141. But it's the third best war game. But wait, is it the third best war game? We'll revisit this in 2005 and 2012. Paths of Glory, the First World War, 1914 to 1918. It has a subtitle. Pits the Central Forces against the Allied Forces in a car-driven World War I simulation that takes about a quick eight hours to play. Take a look at all these chits. Take a look at the ratings, over 4,300 of them. We see lots of eights and lots of nines and tens for an overall rating of 8.1. Take a look at the weight, it comes in at a 3.83. I still have a very strong suspicion that war games Weights are very underrated. So if you're looking to game like it's 1999, Paths of Glory, the First World War, 1914 to 1918, might be the game for you. See you next time. I love when a comment makes me think. And this week someone commented on one of the videos that we did somewhere where I, I called a game dated. And they said, what makes a game dated? And the question basically is, why do we say such things? You know, like we say gameplay mechanisms are dated, artwork and, you know, graphic design are dated. And when we say the game mechanisms are dated, uh, what does that mean exactly? So let's come back to mechanisms in a second. I think the artwork one, basically, there's a certain style that looks modern whatever era you're in, and if you go back and do styles from years gone by, they just don't look like they fit in today, and we learn better things about styles, and perhaps we'll have a circular thing, and we'll like certain styles in the future. So that one's very subjective, but you could see modern, clean design as opposed to stuff that looks like it came out in the 80s and 90s, so that's what we mean when we say that's dated. When a game feels dated, though, the question was, well, does that mean five years ago we just didn't know how to have fun like we do now? That's a good question, right? Are games getting better in general? I think unequivocally, yes, they are. You say, wait a minute, is that cold and new? Not necessarily, that's not what I mean. Don't get me wrong, there's lots of garbage that is produced all the time. Check out our channel, we'll tell you about some of it. But more so than that, I think that game development is something that is like technology. People learn from the past. They get better. We learn how to streamline mechanisms. We learn how to make games better. Uh, you take a sample of any games that came out in the 80s, and I would argue very strongly that more good games came out in 2020 than came out in the entire decade of the 80s. And I'm almost willing to say that about the 90s also, although that's a much stronger statement. But gameplay is getting better. We learn. Are there classic games that stand the test of time? Yes. Are there a lot of them? No. Just like there's a lot of art that doesn't stand the test of time. A lot of stuff is made for today. You ever see a movie that's full of quips and things about current political things that are going on or current events or pop culture? They don't age very well. You watch them years later, you're like, what were they talking about? 
Well, games aren't necessarily like that, but there are a lot of games that are the product of their time. And I think it's reasonable to look at a game. We often talk about card games that come out and we'll say, man, they look like a collectible card game from the 90s. There were a lot of card games that came out in the 90s. It was a bad time. Magic the Gathering came out, but there was a lot of other rip-offs, and they all had a very similar look to them. So now when someone does that, it looks like they're copying that older look. I'm not here to say fashion. Clothing fashion from any age is bad, obviously. But I don't dress like I'm from 1776. I'm not here wearing a wig and such. We've kind of moved away from that, and we move away from that sort of thing in games too. But games are getting better all the time. Will I look back at 2020 games at some point and consider them to be dated? Possibly. But how do we know? Is it one of those, I know it when I see it things? Yeah, I think it is. I don't think this is objective or not. But I think it's a reasonable thing to call, it is reasonable to call something dated, to look at a game and say, yeah, that just needs to be updated, needs to be brought to modern times. We're getting better at graphic design. We have better tools to make games. Our quality of components has gone up, but also our design level goes up. You could say, there will never be as good of a deck builder as Dominion, the first one, the classic one. There will never be a collectible card game as good as Magic the Gathering, the first one. And that's possible. The first one in the genre sometimes is better than the rest. But as time goes by, we learn, we evolve, we see cooler things. We say, this mechanism works. This game solved the problem that other games have. And that's really cool. And so, yeah, I think games can feel dated and no longer in style. What do you all think? Let me know in, in the comments. That's what I think this week. Let's keep moving. Hey everyone, Kim here with Tabletop Rebellion and we are back with another segment of Name the Game where I show you a component from a board game and you try to guess what game it's from. Now last time we left you with this clue. Did you know what game we were talking about? If you guessed Fire in the Library from Weird Giraffe Games, you are correct. You go ahead and grab that extra slice of bacon this morning. The library of all human knowledge has caught on fire and you and your fellow librarians must rush to save as many books as possible. The more books you save, the more knowledge and bravery points you're going to score and the librarian with the most points wins. The length of this game is really going to depend on how quickly the fire spreads throughout the library. That's where the push your luck is really going to come into play. So on your turn, players will draw tokens from a bag and see which books that they can grab from the burning stacks. But you have to be careful. Rushing through the library and pushing your luck and drawing tokens can cause the fire to spread even faster. Luckily, there are tools you can use to help slow the spread of the fire, like a bucket of water or even some tools to help you grab books more efficiently, like a torch. Doesn't make sense, but it totally works. As fire spreads, you flip over one of the cards for each book you had already placed on your turn card. Things can suddenly go from fine to very on fire. The art shows that per fire progression, so it's easy to tell which sections are starting to get much, much worse. Add this to a game box that opens like a book, and you have some great theming. Games last around 30 to 40 minutes, depending on everyone's luck and it plays anywhere from one to six players. So there is a solo mode. So do you have what it takes to save all human knowledge? You're gonna have to push your luck and see. Now, before we wrap up this segment, here's your clue for next week. Do you know what game this is from? See you next time. A game that has individual player powers is a game that has that gives each player a different uh, action, a different power that only they can use. It makes the game very asymmetrical. It might be a different setup, starting setup for them at the beginning of the game, or it might be something that they can use throughout the game. Very popular games such as uh, Marco Polo or uh, Tapestry might have these types of individual player powers that uh, only affect one player in a unique way. A kid's game, however, that does that is Winner Winner Chicken Dinner. Um, this one has just little light individual player power. So if you roll certain dice, somebody gets to steal a dice, or you may purchase one of the action cards for 
for one less. Something like that. Very simple, very light and easy, but sometimes they can be a little bit more complex and give the game a lot of depth because there's a lot of strategies to be able to go through. A game with secret identities is one in which each player is given a secret role, a secret card, a secret identity, and that might be something that the players are trying to figure out around the table, or it might be a unique kind of win condition. Racing games do this a lot, in which you might be dealt a card or a racer that the other players don't know who you're trying to move along the track, and you're trying not to give that away because you don't necessarily want people to know that you're trying to get that car across the finish line, something like that. Uh, this game, House of Borgia, which is an older Scott Alms game, is a riff on Liar's Dice. It has a lot more going on in it than a traditional Liar's Dice game, but in it each player has a specific color that they are, and they're trying to get that cardinal that, that to become the Pope in the game to get the most influence, but you don't want the other players to know uh, who you are, as they could p prevent you from winning. That's it! This is Sparta! <laughs> you know, whether we like it or not, there's wars and there's soldiers and there's this. I mean, human beings are not the best type of people. But whatever. And you know, but war gamers are a small knit group. And you know, me personally, I don't have many people to play with. So. That's why I'm doing this solo segment type thing, you know, because, you know, we're, we're a lonely bunch. Speak for yourself, solo man. You know, back in the glory days of wargaming, you know, there were games like, like Ambush. And sure, you, you can still get it on eBay for about 150 bucks. But anyways, you know, and people are going to say, Ah, oh, but the games were better back then. This and Shut up, the games were amazing today. Oh, the nasty war game creeps and shit. No. Yeah. No. Shut up! Shut up. What the? What the? What the? Dan, I'm not recording a video for you. Shut up! There's games like Space Marine Insurgents, where you're the captain of a squad of space... Marines and you go on other planets and y you get rid of bugs because the bugs They're bugs Ooh, That's deep there Dan a great explanation. I'm sure they're running out the door to get that game And then there's Academy Games conflict of heroes awakening the bear where you're in Russia and You're the Germans and you're trying to take over Russia the whole thing. What were they thinking and they got a solo mode so you can play all this by yourself. And also DVG has Field Commander Napoleon. I mean, look at this. First, that's the grand scope of things where you move armies, bird's eye view, you know, move 15,000 men this way and 10,000 men that way. And then when it's time for battle, you get close and personal. Well, close and personal. It's more of an operational type thing. Scale, I should say. Yeah. There's a fun type arcade game called Red Menace by Brent Ward, World War III in 1959. Think of it like a Doctor Strange Love, but on a serious note. Not that Doctor Strange Love is not on a serious note. Anyways, what happens is you set out and place all your planes ready to go on sorties just to keep things safe, right? And then the Ruskies, as they're known back then, they spawn. So hopefully you're in that airspace, because if you're not, there goes Chicago! Eh? You know, playing war games by yourself is a lot of fun. Look at me. Look how much fun I'm having. You can have the same amount of fun. Shut up! Shut up! And that's it for another Board Game Breakfast, folks. Thanks so very much for watching. Don't forget, we have another Board Game Breakfast that goes out on Thursdays. Stephen Bonacor is joining us for that now, so hopefully you enjoy that. We have lots of great contributors. If you like their segments, please mention it in the comments below. We love the feedback to hear from you all. Until next time, I'm Tom Bass, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Have fun gaming. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production.